The last thing I ever want to be is a helicopter parent. If my son went to school and stayed out of trouble, as far as I am concerned, he could do whatever he wanted. I didn't believe in the idea of sheltering my child. Let him experience the world for himself. I'd always be there to steer him in the right direction, but I never made him walk anywhere. This isn't to say I never kept a close eye on him. I loved my boy. I cooked his meals, helped him with his homework, and tried to be the best father anyone could ask for. But like I said, I rarely interfered with what he wanted to do. If he wanted to stay up watching Teen Titans until midnight, I let him, but he'd still have to go to school in the morning. If he didn't want to floss his teeth, fine, but don't come crying to me when you have cavities. I'd always warn him, but I'd let the natural consequences be punishment over the belt buckle, for instance. Of course there is a limit. I'm all for experience being the best teacher, but there are things that a child should never come to experience. Don't drink it or it will kill you. Don't go there or you'll get lost. Don't pet the dog, you'll lose your hand. That kind of protection is up to every single parent. When my son Teddy was nine, we moved from Concord, North Carolina to Monroe, North Carolina to get Teddy to a better school. We settled into our new house in the corner of Pickens and Crest, smack dab in the middle of a nice suburban neighborhood. There was a small bridge suspended a few feet above a rocky creek, a small park where dogs could run about, but most importantly, there were plenty of kids Teddy's age. All of the friends Teddy brought home were typical to normal kids, timid, polite, perfectly cultivated by their parents. They always said, hello, Mr. Carpenter. Then there was one that said, thanks, John. That bizarre greeting came from the mouth of a doughy little boy named Nathan Burrow. He was in Teddy's class, and he lived a few blocks from our house. Teddy brought him home one day after school. Teddy brought him home one day after school. They met in Mr. So-and-so's class and wanted to go back to play real-life Pokemon. I wasn't fond of the way Nathan played with my son. Sometimes he would grab pine cones off the ground and toss them at Teddy, who would dodge them and laugh gleefully, even though sometimes they'd hit him. I'd find a dozen scratches on his arms and legs, and he'd just say it's not a big deal, they only itch a little. One Sunday morning, the weekend before Halloween, I think I was working on some taxes and I noticed Nathan down the road, outside of the kitchen window. He was swinging a stick around, tapping it against the fence posts as he walked by them, and knocking leaves off the trees. One of the neighborhood cats, named Luna, was relaxing on the sidewalk. Nathan came up to her and smiled, bending down to scratch her ears as she rolled around on the pavement to show her gratitude. I looked down to see my papers to finish filing one of the boxes, but out of curiosity, I glanced back up. Nathan had gotten onto his feet and raised the stick above his head. Luna darted away before he brought it down on the sidewalk with a tremendous crack, snapping it into two. He stood there for a couple seconds, watching the cat disappear into the neighbor's backyard before shrugging and turning back the way he came. I went to talk to his parents that afternoon. Taylor and Eva Burhau couldn't even have been older than 30, and they were absolutely delighted that I came to visit. They invited me inside, offered me coffee, while well, they went about on how happy they were that Nathan finally had a new friend. I began to feel bad about the news I was bringing, so I tried introducing it as delicately as possible. I'm really glad Teddy has a friend that's so nearby, but sometimes I worry Nathan could be... The smiles faded to looks of concern, and I felt my guilt start to skyrocket. I quickly told them that I didn't think it was Nathan's fault at all, it just seems that he doesn't realize that it might be hurting somebody sometimes, and I should have done something about it when I saw it. Burhouse insisted that it wasn't my fault and that they would have a long talk with Nathan. I didn't want to tell them about the cat. At the time, I thought it was impotent to think that it might be something wrong with Nathan. I knew that some kids played rough, and I wasn't exactly a saint to my pets when I was a little boy. Nathan's parents were great people, and I was sure a good, firm talking would set the kids straight. The next time I saw Nathan, the change was clear. He stopped the nonsense about the pine cones and actually called me Mr. Carpenter. I let Teddy have him over as often as usual, sometimes inviting him over to dinner or go to the park. I made sure to stay close, though. When they went out back to play, I sat on the porch with a book. I made sure to accompany them on their walks to the nearby creek. They liked to lean off the railing and throw stones into the water. The ten-foot drop added an extra splash to their stones. Their friendship lasted through elementary school, and Teddy was ecstatic to learn that Nathan would be going to the same middle school as him. The jump from primary school to secondary school is hard for everybody, and not long into that year, Teddy had a problem. There was a posse of boys who rode on Teddy's bus and had the habit of picking on him. They labeled him as nasty slurs like faggot or retard, the typical middle school menu of insults. Teddy and I had a talk about standing up for oneself, but there wasn't much improvement. Teddy even came home crying one day. 
claiming that the seventh grader named Ward Friels called him a pathetic cocksucker. I called the school counselor that evening and we arranged a meeting for the next day. I decided to drive Teddy into school that morning so he could avoid the dreaded bus. I screeched to a halt when a small figure darted in front of the CRV. It was a boy about Teddy's age, sprinting as fast as he could with a backpack full of books. Teddy pointed, repeating the boy's name and announcing that he knew him from math class. I looked in the direction the boy came from and found a gaggle of preteens circle around two thrashing bodies in a sidewalk. The audience scattered like a flock of pigeons. When I got out of my car, the only remaining kids were the ones on the ground. One sat on top of the other, clutching something white. He looked up at me and demanded to know what was going on. I immediately recognized the doughy face of Nathan Burhow. A proud look on his eyes. The other boy was a stranger, who cowered and held his hands over his face. Teddy came up behind me and pointed to the boy Nathan was sitting on. That's Ward, Mom. He's the one who picks on me. I snatched the object from Nathan's hands and stood up, Ward beginning to bawl uncontrollably. The object Nathan was holding was a sock, weighted down by something inside. Turning it over, a bent, now useless combination lock fell onto the pavement. I knelt to help Ward up, and gasped at the state of his swollen purple face. His nose was practically smashed back into his skull with blood dribbling from his nostrils. One of his front teeth were broken into a fang, the others were missing entirely. He must have been hit over a dozen times. Nathan looked back from the lock on the wailing boy in the ground and muttered something. Say your sorry, Ward. There was a hearing the next day. Ward's parents ultimately did not press charges on the Burr house when they found out how my son Teddy had been treated by him. But they had demanded that Nathan be expelled and sent to another school, which the principal agreed to. After that incident, I made Teddy cut off all ties with Nathan. He couldn't return his phone calls, and only I answered the door when he came over. Teddy was very upset that he couldn't hang out with Nathan anymore, claiming that Ward deserved what he got and Nathan was only trying to protect him. I remember asking him, If someone makes you or someone you love feel terrible, does that make it right to do terrible things? Part of me felt bad for Teddy losing one of his favorite friends, but another part of me felt relief that he was no longer associating with Nathan. The whole debacle on the sidewalk sharpened my previously dulled fears about the boy. There was something wrong with him. He seemed to have absolutely no problem hurting others. And he always did it with an air of pride or indifference. The Burhaus kept calling and apologizing, asking if we needed anything or if we wanted to come over and talk again. I accepted their apologies but politely declined their offers, saying that we needed to wait for some wounds to heal before we saw each other again. A few nights later, I was watching television and noticed a small bit of paper that someone had slid under the door. It was a small message written on the index card. Why are you not talking to me? I thought you were my friend. I looked out the window, finding the streets deserted. I called the Burr House immediately, but the infuriating mechanical voice claimed that their line had been disconnected. I thought about marching over there right now and demanding what is going on, but I decided against it. I could go over there in the morning when I was calm, and that way I wouldn't arouse Teddy's suspicion while he was off at school. I took the note into my bathrobe pocket. The next morning I made Teddy's lunch and kissed him on the forehead and sent him off to the bus stop. I couldn't help but watch as he walked by the Burho place. While I observed him, I tucked my hands into the bathrobe pockets idly, feeling the card from the night before. I took it out, rereading the message there, before groaning and placing the card face down on the table. There were words written on the back. You'll regret this. I felt a finger ice trail up my spine as I glanced out the window once again. Teddy was gone. It's true what they say about time slowing down during an adrenaline rush. I dropped the index card, and it seemed to hover in the air as I ran out of the room, pushing my way out the front door onto the lawn. I must have screamed Teddy's name. I honestly don't remember. What I do remember is hearing the terrified 13-year-old voice echo across the street. I rushed towards the source, ignoring the car traveling down the road, ignoring the screech of its brakes. Ignoring the fact that the red headlight barely missed me as I dashed in front of it, Teddy was on the bridge. He had fallen and was hiding his face from the assailant. Nathan held an object above his head, and it glinted in the southern orange sunrise. I must have yelled and screamed because Nathan turned back at me with wild eyes. I ran faster than I ever remember being able to travel. Grabbing Nathan and forcing him away from my son with all the force I could muster. Nathan stumbled backwards and fell over the railing. I didn't scream, exclaim, or even gasp. He just fell, his eyes wide, his mouth open, 
bit in shock. A drop like that could have broken a bone, maybe damaged some nerves at worst, but Nathan fell head first. Landing on a dry crack on the collection of rocks from out from under the water surface. Blood ran from the rocks in the water, the buck knife floating down the current and making lazy circles. He didn't close his eyes. He didn't move. The blood finally stopped roaring in my ears, just in time to hear the distraught wail of Eva Burhau. The woman fell to her knees as Taylor pushed me out of the way and climbed down to the creek to get his son. He rolled the boy over, his broken skull leaking contents into the shimmering water. Eva collapsed, screaming her son's name over and over and over again. It wasn't your fault, the policeman said. You had every right to defend your child, but as the policeman asked me more questions. The news van pulled up in the scene with the paramedics carried the small body away. Taylor held his weeping wife, crying silent tears of his own. Cameras flashed, people yelled, dogs barked. We moved away once it was all over. How could we stay there? All of those eyes staring at us, whispering behind our backs. Teddy was terrified of going to school the next day for fears of what Piers would say to him. So I simply allowed him to stay home. Neither of us got out of bed the day after it happened. Nathan Burhau was declared insane five days after his death. There was a private funeral for his family members and friends only, and we weren't invited.